Welcome everybody to Hack Your Own App. My name is Akira Brand. I work in developer relations at Bright Security. And this is my coworker, Oli. And he is the head of product marketing at Bright. Oli, do you Hi, want to everyone. say a couple words to introduce yourself? Um, I think you did a sterling job yourself, Akira. But uh, really, really uh, looking forward to uh, this workshop. Um, so yeah, I think let's, uh, let's get cracking. Right on. All right, so here's what we're going to cover today. So today we're gonna to cover application security, what it is and how we do it. I'm going to convince you why you need to write secure code and also how you can start to uh, work on writing secure code. We'll talk about why are we going to use Bright as our magical tool that we're going to teach you today to scan your own apps for web vulnerabilities. Um, and also then at the very end, we'll have a workshop We'll go over some common vulnerabilities that we found uh, using the Bright Scanner. We're going to scan an intentionally vulnerable web application. We'll go over those results with you. And we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A at the very end. Um, at the end of the day, what I really want to leave you with is that writing secure software is worth the effort. So if there's nothing else that you leave this talk with today, it's that looking into writing secure software, learning about the principles of writing secure software is absolutely worth it to you. Okay, I know Ollie had a moment to introduce himself. Let's talk about uh, me a little bit. Uh, so my name again is Akira. I'm a software developer and an educator. I've worked in software development for three years, mainly in e-commerce and ed tech. Um, one of my coolest Things I like to talk about that I'm really proud of is I was a NASA Hackathon Award recipient back when I was first starting my software development journey. Um, we made an, a concept that used NASA satellite data to scan refugee camps to see what kind of resources would be the most needed at those camps. Um, and then a fun fact about me is that I moonlight as an opera singer. I was a musician for over 10 years professionally before I moved to tech, and I still do uh, perform quite a bit. So if you Google my name and the word opera, you will find some cool stuff. All right, so here's what you need to participate today. You need a laptop or a desktop, of course, with admin privileges and the ability to install software. The reason being is we are going to install Bright's DAST today. We're also going to install something called a repeater, which essentially is a tool to make sure that when you are scanning, the scan itself comes from your IP address, not from our IP address on the cloud. Um, and for those two things, you do need admin privileges. Uh, you'll need a modern web browser like Firefox or Google Chrome. Uh, of course, connected to the Wi-Fi. If you are watching this and not connected to Wi-Fi, I want to know how. You must be very impressive. <laughs> um, and if you want, you can just watch. You don't really necessarily need to do the workshop to learn something from this, from this class. And Mark, yes, MacBook is totally fine. That's what I'm on. Dennis is hardwired in, right on. <laughs> All right, sounds like a plan. Let's keep going. Okay, so our goal today is uh, helping you automate your application security. So imagine that you are building your dream house. You have saved for this house for over 20 years. You finally are able to find the builders. You have the perfect plot of land and you go ahead and build your dream house for you and maybe your partner. Maybe y'all have some children. Let's say you have five or six children. You know, you have a lot of kids. Um, once you're done building this house, you look at the floor plan and you realize oh no, I forgot to add more than one bathroom and I have six children. This is going to be chaos. What was I thinking? So now you have to spend a lot more money, a lot more time. Your builders are really irritated with you. You're flat broke at this point to add more bathrooms. Otherwise there's going to be chaos in your house, right? With six children and two adults. So that is kind of what happens with software and security. So in the software development life cycle, we have our process, we have our planning phase, we have our build phase, we have our test phase, and then we have release. Now, what normally happens with security is that it sort of gets shoehorned in, in between test and, in between, and, and release. And that is very expensive. It's similar to looking at your house and going, oh no, I forgot to add bathrooms. 
So that's expensive. It's stressful. Uh, software gets released with a bunch of security bugs. Um, it's not, it's not great. So what we want to empower you to do today is to shift security left in the software development life cycle. Um, so what we mean by that is we want to shift the mentality of writing secure code and testing your code to make sure that it is secure much earlier in the SDLC. So we're talking about in the planning phase from inception and using a tool like a DAST, like Bright's DAST, will help you to do that and help to automate that. So why do we care? Why bother writing secure code? Let me say it this way. Like with the house, the earlier you do it, the cheaper and easier it is to deal with. Security issues are a big deal. Um, if you are a software developer, you could be writing software, for example, for someone's heart monitor. You could be writing it for airplanes. You could be writing it for hospitals. And if that code is not secure from jump, a hacker can get in, a bad actor can get in and really mess with people's livelihoods. This comes down to something called the CIA triangle, which stands for confidentiality, availability, and integrity. This triangle is the raison d'etre. It's the reason of being for all InfoSec security teams on your in your company. So if you are having this mentality of, okay, is the code I'm writing available at all times? Is the code I'm writing protecting my user's confidentiality? Is it protecting the integrity of the data? You can actually partner much better with your security team. And in a way, you can kind of get them off your back a little bit, right? Which is something that can be a, a source of tension in many companies. Um, so of course, we talked a little bit about what can happen with insecure code. Another thing that can happen, web servers behind a firewall can, if someone gets behind that, they can attack your network, they can attack your database, they can change it, they can copy it, they can delete it, and it's just a mess. So the earlier you fix this, the earlier you look into it, and the more intentional you are about it, the better. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to come in with our superhero capes and we're going to do something about it today. So Bright is going to be the DAS scanner to the rescue. It's a magical tool that we are teaching you today to take to your own code and scan it for security vulnerabilities. Um, hopefully that you, as you lead this workshop, you will decide that you want to test your own code with what you learned today before you send it to QA. Um, you could even build uh, this DAST into your CI CD pipeline if you have one. And I do promise you that if you continue to be curious and creative, you will get better at secure coding. Okay, um, so I want to hand it off to Ollie right now. He's going to talk a little bit more about Bright itself and how it compares and contrasts with other security tools out there, which you can also use for your code. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Kieran. A great, uh, a great introduction, and you know, really, the, the the main focus of this is being able to shift security testing left. Okay, so um, putting security testing into the hands of the, of the developers. And one thing I wanted to say, sort of first and foremost, is in the recent Gartner um, uh, Gartner um, uh, document on application security testing really interesting fact that they came up with now, having done a, a survey with a considerable number of organizations spanning multiple different sizes, but particularly across enterprise ones as well, is actually that 50% of engineering managers are now responsible for application security. The tide is certainly shifting to enable uh, or, or to ensure that security testing is, is keeping up with you, your de the, the developers pace so that you're not going to be shipping security vulnerabilities into production at the same rate that you are uh, new features and everything else. So being able to put uh, security testing into the hands of you, the developer, really is important to, um, uh, to ensure that you're secure by design. But ultimately, you need a tool that's going to keep up with the pace of, uh, of you, the developer. So to put a bit of context into who Bright are and, and, and I suppose where we fit into um, into your pipelines and into your SDLC. So some of you may or may not be using, um, you know, software composition analysis, SCA, for example. And please, you know, let us know in the, in the chat. I did see one person in the chat say that you were using a, a multitude of different uh, DAS tools in particular, but it'd be great to see what other tools you guys uh, out there are using. Um, 
The SCA is looking at your dependencies, looking at the libraries, ensuring that they're patched and indeed up to date. So you may be using the likes of, um, of Sneak or Fossa or indeed uh, JFrog, for example. Then you may be using static application security testing tools, SAS tools, that really are looking pretty much from a one-dimensional space, but looking at your, your code as you, as you type it, looking for security vulnerabilities, which is a really, really useful tool to ensure that you are finding certain vulnerabilities as early as possible. But actually, this technology is, is, is fraught with false positives. And because it's not looking at the built or the running or the compiled application, actually what happens is, is you're missing a lot of the vulnerabilities that will always mean that you have to rely on one or indeed two of, uh, of, of two things. A manual penetration test that's going to be carried out uh, periodically perhaps um, by, by a security team if you have one, or indeed as a sort of compliance checkbox once a year uh, on a periodic basis. And it's those that will actually be using a dynamic application security testing tool like Brights to actually look for uh, exploitable vulnerabilities in your applications, in your, applica uh, in your API, sorry, um, looking at it from the outside in, in the same way that a malicious user or an ethical hacker or you know, uh, an actual hacker would be as well. So you would always have to carry out some form of dynamic scan or, or manual testing that will we will be looking for these exploitable vulnerabilities at some point. And when we talk about shift left, SCA and SAST have always predominantly been a developer-focused tool. And actually, it's really about putting the missing link in that chain as early as possible and putting DAST, dynamic application security testing, into the hands of developers as early as possible, as uh, Akira mentioned, and to be able to run these tests as often as possible as well. Um, against your internal apps, web apps, APIs, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please, uh, Akira. So what we did, we've, you know, the DAS tools have been around for a long time. We, we, uh, it's a very um, old, established technology, but has typically been built for security professionals, for cybersecurity experts, for penetration testers, AppSec specialists to use, not built from the ground up to enable developers to actually start to own this process. Now, we've looked at the limitations and the pain points that organizations have in being able to implement comprehensive, effective, dynamic security testing scans inbuilt into the uh, SDLC as part of your CI-CD pipelines. And we've done this you know, in, in a number of different ways. And this is really sort of introduction before we go into the workshops so that you can sort of get an understanding of the sort of capabilities that are very, very developer focused with the Bright technology. So first of all is the, uh, the coverage and analysis. Um, you have the ability to scan your web apps, your internal apps, APIs, whether that's SOAP, REST, GraphQL, and we also have WebSocket support too. In, a, in this age of this very agile um, development uh, that we have, and a very, very heavy reliance on APIs and microservices. This is going to be fully supported with the Bright uh, Scanner. And we're going to get onto that and showcase to you um, how that can be used to test those as well. Trying to um, scan against um, login uh, defined places of your application behind a multitude of different authentication mechanisms will also be supported um, with the Bright Scanner. And we support a number of uh, different ones, and we will get onto that because I know that I'm sure you're all sort of raring to get to, uh, to the workshop. But you'll see that there are multiple different ways for us to discover the attack surface. You know, for developers, uh, AppSec professionals, we have crawling. Now, this will crawl the application, scroll, crawl the web app, detect the uh, entry points, extract the parameters, and actually build the, the attack surface in order to carry out the test. But we have a proprietary headless browser uh, technology that actually enables our, um, our engine and our crawler to interact with your targets very much like a human would, to mimic a human interaction with the web application. And this enables us to uh, interact with drop downs, you know, clickable parts of the website um, in order to maximize the attack surface. Because it's all about maximizing coverage, running as tests as early as possible finding security vulnerabilities early and often in order to remediate them way before they hit production. 
if you are um, and subject to, I suppose, the maturity of your of your processes here, um, you could also leverage QA to actually also start um, uh, carrying out the uh, security test. Or if you're a developer and you're using uh, proxies like uh, Selenium, Cypress IO, or indeed others, you can actually start to leverage your existing functional scripts to now start carrying out security tests as well by um, uploading half files, HTTP archive files into the scanner. This is a recorded interaction and actually will enable you to also scope out and define the scope of the tests. Record an interaction with a specific entry point, upload the HAR, run a scan that's going to actually last for, you know, a few minutes instead of several hours and days. And that's really what you, the developers, need. You need scans that are going to be fast and made in order to maintain your rapid release cycles. And as we mentioned before, the sort of um, the reliance now and the, the heavy use of, of, of microservices, single page applications, as well as the exponential growth, of course, with, with APIs, you have the ability of being able to test these by uploading your, um, your API schema or your API documentation, whether that's Swagger or, or OpenAPI, or indeed uploading your, your Postman collections as well. And we'll show you how you can uh, do that uh, during the workshop, but also enable you to actually uh, scope um, the, uh, uh, the, the tests as part of, the, um, of that as well, using our um, OpenAPI uh, schema editor that's, that, that's inbuilt. But really, for this to really be effective, how have we made this useful for defective? Develop, you, the developer, how, uh, what tools are at your uh, use in order to have DAST intrinsically in, the, in your CICD pipelines? So we really are truly built for developers from the ground up. We weren't, we didn't start off as a, as a security testing tool built for pen testers, built from the ground up uh, to be a DAST tool built, built for you, the developer. So you can stay within your terminal, right? Configure scans and control scans directly from the CLI via code. As Akira mentioned, actually, the, the end game is to have the Bright Scanner integrated into your CI CD pipelines. Every single build, every commit automatically spins off a scan in order to test, in order to test for security vulnerabilities. Um, and actually, then you get that direct feedback loop, which is really so important um, for developers to own that security testing process. As Akira mentioned, there's nothing worse than building your house and realizing you forgot to put the bathroom in once it's finished. There's nothing worse for a developer than a year later getting a knock on your shoulder to say, by the way, you made a mistake one year ago when you were working on this specific feature, and suddenly you're context switching, right? You now need to go back, try and find out what you were doing. It's been ages since you worked on that, um, 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 uh, ages since you've been working on that specific feature. The specific developer that was working on that may not even be, be there anymore. So the earlier that you can do this, you're going to be secure by design. So these can be fully controlled with YAML configuration files um, to manage the process. And we can build the scan surface from the very first unit test. And actually, um, if you haven't already done so, you know, sign up for our newsletter because we've got some very exciting news um, about unit testing. We've integrated our scanner with certain unit testing uh, and web frameworks um, in order to carry out DAS scans even earlier on every function or every component that you make with tests that last for seconds, not minutes. And that really is, that really is key. One of the fundamental pillars of our technology, and I'm sure if we were sat in an auditorium now and I could see you all, uh, and I asked, you know, hands up, if you hate false positives, you'll all be jumping in your seats in agreement. With so one of the fundamental things with our technology is that we go through an automatic validation of every exploitable vulnerability that we can detect. So once we go through the workshop and once you sign up and start using our scanner to test your applications and APIs, you can be categorically sure that every result, every report, that uh, every vulnerability that we report has been automatically validated by our engine. So it's actually actionable, right? You don't need to go away and manually validate. And if there are any engineering managers or anything along those lines, if there's anyone from a cybersecurity background, are you an, are you an AppSec? Uh, person dealing with your pipeline, how much time are you wasting in, in prioritizing? Which vulnerabilities do I want to test? And a key issue with um, security debt, which actually leads to a, a substantial amount of technical debt because of that, 
is not actually knowing where your security vulnerabilities are. Your Jira, your Jira uh, tickets are, are bursting out the seams because they need to go to that manual validation. And actually what happens is the tool gets ignored at best and more than likely actually gets disabled. It's one of the, the, the fundamental pain points that our technology looks to address. Accurate results with developer-friendly remediation guidelines so you know that what's real is, is there, prioritize the fix, and then be secure by design. And all of this integrated into your pipeline. There is a nice UI for security, and Akira is going to be going through the UI um, showing you how to run a scam. But ultimately, it's all about you staying within your environment. So using the CLI, integrating with you know, CircleCI, with Jenkins, with your ticketing, um, in order to automate the process. And we talk about shift left, DevOps, DevSecOps, all these different, different uh, uh, terminologies and methodologies. It's all about automation, and it's all about developers, which typically outweigh security by 50 or 100 to 1, being part of a solution and having this collaborative team to actually, to actually start uh, fixing vulnerabilities early and often. In terms of speed, one thing you'll notice is actually the, uh, the speed at which our, our, our scanner can test. And that really also boils down to the, the way that you can um, scope and define the tests, as I've mentioned before, Ad adjusting the scan scopes um, to have those tests that run for you know, minutes, not hours, and indeed days. And one thing we'll, we'll show you is our very bright, if you want to call that, bright as an intelligent, but smart scanner um, that actually takes away a lot of the heavy lifting for you, for you the developers. So actually um, automatically skipping certain tests that are going to be irrelevant without the need for you to go through what can be a very lengthy and complicated configuration of other tools. I noticed uh, one of the, um, on the chats, the Burp Suite, OS Zap, and a, and a few others. These are very much security testing tools built for pen testers. So we tried to remove that. And I think once you sign up and we go through it with Akira, you'll really notice how the, the engine is so easy to use. And you can literally be up and scanning within minutes. Um, and for those of you that are sort of, you know, looking at, uh, you know, payloads or interested in that, um, I've mentioned this, the, the smart scanning. We also interact with the target applications. Okay, so we're not just looking at trivial attacks or injections. Um, but our smart technology um, can understand context. And actually, we look to try and break the logic. How can we break your validation mechanisms with your application to try and find logic-based or business logic vulnerability? And this is really key to not only just trying to find the trivial stuff, but how can we find as much as possible as early on in order so that you're not having to fix these way downstream once they're in production, and hopefully you find them you know, before someone else, someone else does. So we'll go through in the, um, uh, during the, the workshop and we can look at some of the testing categories there. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Kira. Yeah. And Ollie, we have a couple of questions. Can you sure. answer them really quick? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I can read them out. Um, so the first one is, is the scanner the same as having a router which can monitor traffic of devices? Sorry, where, which was the... Um, oh, these are in the chat. This kind of same as having a router which can monitor traffic of devices. So, so, so we are a scanner, so we're not monitoring the, the traffic. Um, what I was alluding to before, maybe, with the half file is a proxy that um, will monitor the traffic, look at the re responses and the requests. Then you can then save all that content to then feed that into the engine, and then we can use that to then replay and then and then start attacking. So we're not looking at uh, we're not looking at, uh, at that part. No um, uh, scanner actively investigate monitor passively see what happens. Um, oh, I see that was Mike invest, uh, replying to the same question. Um, virus total. I must admit I'm not familiar with that um, scans files. So we do have a file upload test that we can get through that um, as well. Um, we are a dynamic application security testing tool. In fact, if you go to our docs, docs.brightsec.com, you can see a full list of all the different vulnerabilities that we try and uh, detect there. Uh, I'm just going to try and scoot through a lot of these now. If not, we can wait till the end. Um, um, interference from this is software like malware bytes. Um, so yeah, so 
um, interference. There will be interference from WAFs, for example. That's what Akira alluded to, uh, to before. If you're using the repeater, uh, you may have to whitelist RIP, but typically if you're using the repeater, that will then also come through your IP address, so you shouldn't have a, uh, a problem there. Um, how does this compare with something like Rapid7? So yeah, Rapid7 also have um, you know, a DAS tool, um, and all of the reasons that I mentioned uh, beforehand um, are reasons why we built our technology. Um, better coverage, um, authentication mechanisms, developer first, uh, first and foremost, built for the, from the ground up for developers, no false positives among, among a multitude of other different reasons. Uh, James, we can certainly um, have a more in-depth conversation about that. But looking at this slide, thank you, Akira, this is really what it should look like. Okay, so typically DAS was performed at stages four and five. Uh, actually, what you should be using is the bright scanner as early as possible. Every single time some code is committed, um, it triggers the CI, it initiates a scan with bright. You can set, of course, as part of those YAML configuration files at the breakpoint, uh, whether you want the scan to continue going or whether you, not, you want the scan to stop. Um, um, and that way you can start to, to, to run tests against you know, every build, every commit to really, really be secure by design. You have multiple integrations uh, with uh, ticketing, with messaging like Slack, for example. Um, it's all about having that feedback loop back to the developers, perhaps governed by security, um, you know, looking through the UI, but ultimately you want to stay within your within your turn at terminal, automate as much of the process, find the low to medium and some many high hanging fruits, um, and then be in a position to remediate these a lot sooner, um, more often. Uh, and like we've said you know, multiple times, it's going to be the cheapest, most efficient way for a business case, for the number crunches out there. But for you as a developer, get it done now. You won't need to do it later uh, and focus on actually doing what we want to do. And that's releasing really, really cool features at breakneck speed. Um, I, yeah, I think I'm done actually. I think that's my last slide, uh, Akira. Awesome. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks, Ali. And then one last question. Do we integrate with Microsoft Teams? Microsoft Teams? Um, no, not yet, but I like that idea. So I'm going to put that, uh, I'm going to put that to our, uh, to our product. Awesome. Okay, how many awesome. Else, well, how many else uses MS, uh, anyone else use MS Teams? I'm assuming is that for um, for ticketing or anything on those lines for messaging? Okay. Um, well, I've got a couple of people. Always good to get some feedback. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Um, thanks, Ali. And then, okay, so hopefully we have convinced you that uh, using Bright is a good way to go, and that is what we're going to use today as our DAST scanner of choice. Um, so with that being said, let's get into the workshop. Um, and yes, I love all of the talk about MS Teams. I used it in my last job and whew, what a time. Okay, so let's get going. So the, here's what we're going to do in this workshop. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to set up an account with Bright. We're going to download and install the repeater. Um, we're going to create a scan together using the UI. We're not going to do it through our terminal today, but through the UI. We'll run a scan on um, an intentionally vulnerable website called brokencrystals.com. While the scan runs, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the tool. We're also gonna talk about prevention tips for you. Um, Cause of course the best, uh, the best way to deal with cybersecurity vulnerabilities is to never write them into your code in the first place. So we'll talk about some prevention and then we'll discuss a few of the results from our, uh, from our scan. So the first thing we're going to do, I would please like everyone to go to www.brightsec.com. I'm going to do this with you. I've actually put a link, uh, Akira, in the chat if oh, people you want did. to okay. use that. Yeah, awesome. and it will actually take you directly to the, um, the sign up page. So that's oh, fantastic. OK, so if you use that link, it'll go directly to the sign up page. But if you go to brightsec.com up here on the top right, you're going to click sign up. OK, so let's go to try it free okay so we're going to go to create a free account you can do this a couple ways you can do this with your github that's what i did it's uh the simplest way for me as a developer to just get things done uh, but you can also sign up with google or you can sign up with your email today i'm going to use uh, an email sign up because i already have my github account 
connected. So we're going to sign up with a new and uh, improved email for myself. But choose your sign up method. And again, if you have uh, questions or problems, put them in the Q&A or put them in the chat. So let's go sign up with email. First off, my full name, Akira Brand. Email, we're going to use my Gmail right here. Password, choose a password that is secure. That would be super ironic if you chose an insecure password to use with this. All right, and then create free account. So of course, um, as is the case with many modern um, web apps, we're going to confirm our email address. So I'm actually gonna do that on a page over here that you can't see, but you just have to trust me that I am doing it. Let's go to Gmail and confirm an email address. Okay, so let's verify my email. Okay, so now I'm gonna go here to sign in. Let me pull this over. Okay, let's go ahead and sign in. So let's go here. Um, let's go back to our shared screen. So I have confirmed my email. Um, and again, some of you might have already done this before, but if you or have done this by now, but just in case we're still running behind with some people, that's also totally fine. And we want to walk through. Um, so let's create a new organization. We're going to call this Akira's Awesome Organization, of course. So we're going to go ahead and create. And this is the setup wizard. So I definitely want to walk people through the setup wizard here if we can. Um, so the setup wizard, the intention is that you, this will help you install the repeater on your machine. It'll also help you install the CLI. Um, because of course I work here, I already have the CLI and the repeater installed, but I did want to walk you through the process. So what you do is you're going to push next. Um, and depending on what kind of machine you're on, you can use Docker, you can use NPM, and you can use the Windows installer. Um, I personally am on a Mac. Um, and so I like to use NPM. So that's what I'm going to use. But like I said, you can also use Docker or the Windows installer. Um, what you can do is you will copy this command. You'll go to your terminal. Ooh, where's my terminal? And no, oh, sorry, I open up my terminal here. You'll copy this command and paste it in your terminal. Like I said, I already have the um cli installed um and so i won't need to necessarily do that but what i will do after you install that what you should do is you should click on uh this button down here and make sure that it is installed by checking the version so let's go ahead and do that together i'm going to close this because it's a little distracting all right so version 8.7.1 that is the current version. That should be what you're getting. If you're not, let us know in the chat. Um, and just to make sure that your, your CLI has been installed. Okay, so then we're gonna push next. What you can do here is you're gonna start the repeater. Um, and again, this, this will start the repeater um, and to make sure that all scans come from your IP address, not the IP address of Bright. Uh, the main reason for this is because um, we want to make sure that when you are scanning, it's all, it's all essentially all kosher. It's all good um, because sometimes people will try to scan web apps that they don't have authorization or permission to scan. That's one thing I do want to mention is that don't go ahead and scan like Walmart.com because you do not have written permission to do that. So that's what the repeater does. It essentially says, okay, this scan is coming from your computer, not ours. So that if you try to do kind of strange stuff, it's on you at this point. Okay, let's take another uh, let's take another break really quick to check out some troubleshooting issues. IS says, is it the command at Windows? Uh, I have a good question. The Windows installer, I think, are you talking about, um, are you talking about the CLI or are you talking about the repeater? If you could just, uh, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, he's, go ahead. Go ahead, Ollie. No, I was just going to say he's talking about the, um, um the command line so yeah it would be um it would be for that for uh for windows but i think um 
Uh, I have reached out to a colleague just to see um, what the issue is with the Windows installer. So um, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to you all once I've got some verification. Okay, cool. We'll get that to you in just a moment. Aya wants, uh, wants support. And Yasser had, yeah, he had a really good workaround. You can use this other version. Okay, John is up and running. Dan, the repeater, version 8.8.0 .8 repeater running. That should be okay. Let's see here. Um, Catherine, can you give me a little bit more details about where you're struggling on the CLI? Because then we can help you. I'll wait for you on a little bit there. Just uh, Catherine definitely want to know where you're struggling so we can give you some help. Okay, let's continue on. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start the repeater with the following command. I'm going to do it with npm, not with Windows installer, or else I'm going to get some really strange things. And this repeater, it does need to be started in order for us to use it, of course. So let's go back here to our terminal and we'll start the repeater. All right, starting the repeater. Copy and paste in the command line, but I found errors, command not found. Catherine, what, um, are you on a Windows or a Mac? Mac, okay. And are you stuck in the CLI section or are you stuck on the repeater section? CLI section, okay. So what I want you to try, we're just, let's troubleshoot this for a little bit. Um, and if it works, cool. And if not, we'll move on and maybe Ali can help you one-on-one -on -one a little bit more. Um, what I want you to do is instead of copy pasting it, actually click on these two squares right here that will actually copy the full command. My guess is that potentially what happened is that maybe one of the characters didn't get properly copied. So try copying that top one right there and then just paste it into your terminal. And then let me know what happens there. Okay, let's continue. All right, for everybody else, what I want you to do is definitely check and see that your repeater is started. It should say something like this, the repeater started. All right, Catherine, that's a good point from Kenya and Kwan that make sure you have Node and NPM installed. Otherwise it will not work. So cool, Mark has 8.8.0 .8 repeater installed. That started, that's fine. That's good. Okay, let's move on. Catherine, definitely check to see if you have Node installed and if not, go ahead and um, install Node as well. And then that will help. Okay, and if you have more questions, um, please put in the chat. And then Ollie, if you'd be willing, um, if you could also maybe help um, Catherine and anybody else as we continue forward, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. I just um, I'm just going to get a link. I think uh, I has actually uh, provided the uh, the correct link. I think there may be a, a, an issue with the link there. Once Fantastic. I have that, I will I will put it in the chat for everyone. Don't worry. Okay, cool, cool. All right, let's move on. Um, if at this point you're super, super stuck, it's okay. Just continue to watch and what you will definitely still learn some stuff from this. No stress, no panic. We'll get it figured out. Okay, let's push done. We are, we're, our repeater is started and we're good to go. So the first thing we're going to do, we're here in the Neurolegion CLI. Um, as you can see, I have dark mode on. We do have a dark mode. Um, and what you're going to do is on the top left here, you're going to push create scan. We're going to name our scan. I'm going to say scan number one scan number one we're going to choose a project for now it's just going to be a default project we're going to do a single scan and you what you can do here is if you want you can choose a template so you can choose a shorter version of a scan you can have a light scan a passive scan you can scan just for the main things on the oas top 10 so that is possible. Um, for now, let's go ahead and choose the OWASP top 10. We're gonna do import configuration. Okay. And let's see here. What we're now gonna do is we're gonna go over here to targets. This is where we're gonna input our URL. The attack service discovery, go ahead and push via automatic crawling. Our repeaters, we're going to use the default repeater that we just started in our CLI. Um, one thing that is good to know is that if you close your computer or your computer goes to sleep, the scan will stop. 
So make sure that your computer, um, you make sure that your computer stays open. Now for a crawler target, we're going to do HTTPS colon slash slash broken crystals.com. That is the URL of the target that we're going to be scanning today. This is the intentionally vulnerable website. All of this for now, we're not going to worry too much about. Ollie will go over some of the more intense or the more in-depth abilities and what you're going to scan um, in a minute here. But for now, we're just doing a very basic scan. And then we're going to push start scan. Yes. OK. And now while this is scanning, let's take a second and look at the questions that we had and do some troubleshooting. And then after that, Ollie will talk a little bit more about the advanced scanning options. And then from there, again, while the scan is still running, we will talk a little bit about prevention. So for now, um, Ollie, I'm going to open the floor to both of us so that we can help answer questions um, and we can help troubleshoot a little bit. Does that sound like a plan? That sounds like a plan, yes. Cool. Um, so just so everyone knows, anyone that's using Win, um, if, uh, I put a link in there. Um, for the uh, the correct download for the next boy CLI uh, MSI there for you I think it's the same one that uh, Aya put so thank you very much for that um, but that should be um, that should be done for you uh, next point as I saw but as soon as I open as admin the screen vanishes let's go over the solutions uh, Aya which screen is vanishing if you don't mind me, uh, if you don't mind me asking um, and we can look at that uh, as well. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up just because that's the way that my scroller works. I don't know how high up to go. Um, do we have plans to add the top 10 2021 update? So, uh, James, great question. Uh, yes, we are. I think they've actually already been implemented. Uh, we're actually um, doing a series of uh, internal benchmarking. Um, and very, very soon we will have uh, the most coverage for the OS uh, top 10 uh, of any DAST uh, out there, really alluding to um the capabilities of um of the way that we interact um and perform our tests uh, actually to enable you to, to to cover a lot more of that so yes the answer to that is yes and including by the way the um uh, api top 10 as well um uh let's see docker finds mark has the repeater started great leonard uh, leandro done wonderful um let's see uh, copied and pasted into the command line, Max, your live section, same result. Uh, Catherine, um, probably need to scroll up a bit more. John's connected and up and running, great. Um, Jan, Jan or Jan, um, repeater running with the most up-to-date one, fantastic. Aya um, had the issue with MSI, which actually should now be resolved. Please do let us know. Um, John's up and running, which is great, as is Juan. Okay, now let's start from the, the beginning again. So, um, API top 10 and OWASP top 10. So the OWASP top 10 really looks at the top 10 security vulnerabilities that were out there in the wild. Uh, they take a lot of information from organizations across the world, um, including many you know, sort of large um, multinational enterprise organizations to really try and understand which were the most exploited vulnerabilities there and which are the ones that you should really, really be focusing on, which ones are the flavor of the year, uh, as it were. So there's obviously different um, uh, exploits for both you know, uh, web applications and indeed um, um, uh, APIs. So uh, you can do a simple search of OS top 10, OS API top 10, and you'll see there are you know, two or three differences. Actually, it's very, very similar, but because of the rise in the usage and indeed the rise in the um, exploiting of APIs um, that have led to some pretty serious breaches um, with tens, if not hundreds of millions of uh, people's data being stolen, actually what OWASP quite rightly did, and they're an unbelievable organization, um, uh, they've created the OWASP API top 10 as well. So, you know, when you look at our, um, our, uh, our templates or if you want to, to to look at um, configuring your scans a bit differently, there are going to be certain tests that are going to be irrelevant to test uh, APIs, and you can, you'll be able to see those in the templates uh, as well. Um, let's see. Uh, I open it from Windows. Next, I open as admin. 
the screen opens and vanishes. I am afraid I don't have a solution to that, I'm afraid. Um, let's see, what capabilities do you offer for APIs? Can Swagger files be leveraged? So Jane, that's a great question. Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, Akira, if you wouldn't mind just hitting create scan. Yeah. And let's, uh, let's, let's show James um, the API security testing uh, capability. So let's actually, um, um, let's go to the advanced section, actually. Um, it's sure. not that advanced. The standard is really there uh, to just click and go, but let's just look at the advanced for a second. Um, so uh, we'll call it Ollie Scan. Wonderful. It always needs to be assigned to a project. Um, scan template, we don't need that. Uh, just scroll down a little bit more. Uh, we've also got scheduling just so that you can schedule a scan to, you know, for a specific scan to run over the weekend, or if you wanted to run um, multiple scans daily, weekly, monthly, then you can schedule that there just so that you're all aware. Um, if you click on uh, targets, please, Akira, on the left. Targets, there we go, sorry about that. Um, so uh, James, you can see here that's no, a bit, bit above uh, Akira. So what you'll see, um, you'll see we have the different discovery attack surface me methods. So what Akira showcased, showcased was the crawling. We also have the recorded session via Han. And this is what I was explaining before, where you have the ability of leveraging um, HTTP archive files or HAR files, which are a recorded interaction with the target application. Now, uh, you can also leverage your functional scripts. Okay, If you're using Selenium or Cypress, all of those functional scripts can be exported as a HAR file. Or if you were just to go to um, a web app, um, open up the developer tools. Um, in fact, uh, Akira, just open up Broken Crystals and we can show, show, show them this. Um, yeah, so um, if we open up the developer tools, F12 or shift F12, so yeah, inspect, um, go to the network tab, uh, which is, yeah. If you disable cache, um, preserve logs and disable cache and preserve logs, so if we were to then go to, let's say, the sign in or the contact us form page uh, of the website, you can see here that actually what we do is we, we, we can record the requests and the responses. Now, this is a very good way of being able to really scope the definition of the test. So if you just worked on a new contact us form, just to keep it really, really simple, um, you can just you know, put your name in the name, email address, add a note and click submit. That will record the requests and the responses from the uh, application. And if Akira were to right click on, um, on the request and the response on the right-hand side, I'm not sure if we'll be able to see it with your, with your screen share. Um, there we go, you can save all as hard with content. Now this gives you the ability of you know, interacting with perhaps harder to reach parts of your application. Maybe you want to record a login sequence or login process. And we can then record the cookies or the tokens or whatever it might be within the half file, and then use that to, uh, to scan, to authenticate. Um, if you wanted to look at um, you know, microservices, then that will be picked up. You can even in the half file, pick up certain API calls, and then you can then include that as part of the hosts in order to then start scanning the API that's defined within the scope of that, that half file. And um, if you saved all content with HAR, you can then simply go, if you just go back to the, um, uh, to the UI, please, um, you can upload that with the HAR. So literally, if you scroll down, you'll be able to upload um, a file from a disk or uh, a pre-uploaded file that you might have already within your storage within the UI. And just if you scroll up to the top, please, Akira, um, you also have the ability, by the way, of running, crawling with the HAR file concurrently. So if you wanted to test a, you know, a, a, an authenticated part or wanted to test a specific authentication mechanism, you could use that as part of the heart and then have the crawler to then start crawling other parts of it as well. But you, know, you have that functionality there to use um, either of them or indeed both at the same time. But going back to James's original question about what capabilities we offer for APIs, can Swagger files be, uh, be supported? Absolutely. So if we just click on the via API schema, Yep, sorry, one second. Okay, now if you scroll down, now there's multiple different uh, methods of you doing it. So you can upload a file from your disk to add your Swagger or OpenAPI documentation or indeed your Postman collections. 
You can again, of course, use a pre-uploaded file that's already uploaded into the, uh, into the engine, or you can link to a file. So if you have your API schema um, um, you know, on the web or whatever it might be, you can actually link to that as well. And we can actually showcase you that now. So Kira, if you just go back to Broken Crystals, and by the way, all of you can do this um, as well. Um, maybe not now if your scan's still running, uh, but just go back on this application. Um, and you can still see that the request responses were being recorded. If you click on API schema, this is something you can all do after your initial scan's done. Click on open API JSON. Okay, and we can see here that this is actually our API schema. Um, that's um, you know open for everyone to see. You can just simply record, uh, copy that link, put that into the uh, the UI. Yes. Next one along, Akira. Yeah. Okay, and link to file. Paste that within. And then you can see there that actually the um, the hosts will get passed, it's an authorized host. And another thing that we can show you here is actually we can open up the schema in our schema editor. Now, what does this do? You can see here that on the left-hand side, it says broken crystals, there's a yellow dot there. Now, what this shows actually is that we're missing a lot of information within our API schema here. Okay, so it's a way of you being able to one, validate, it's basically an API linter, it enables you to validate whether your uh, API schema is, is, um, is, has got the correct content in there. So if we just scroll down, we can see we've got broken crystals paths, and then we've got post API render, and then it will show that we're missing something. Okay, if you just scroll down a little bit. Yep. So just click on that, uh, click on the drop down, and we can see here that we're missing. Yep, click on that. We can scroll down and see that we're missing the value here. Now, why is this relevant? So first of all, we should really all, always have an example of a value. Is it an email address or whatever it might be? Is it a specific string? And this actually, one, means, you, means that you've got a complete API schema, but it also means that you're going to have a, um, a proper functioning comprehensive security scan, okay? Because the engine needs to know what it's supposed to expect. Um, so it's just one other way of ensuring that your API scans are going to be full, are going to be complete, and it's going to return um, uh, proper results. One big issue when it comes down to security testing, particularly APIs when using the schema, is that the schemas just aren't right. They're not relevant. They obviously need to be written you know, by developers. You've got a thousand other things that you need to do on your plate. So it's just another way of being able to validate that the schema is correct and up to date. So you can input those details. And that obviously ensures that your scan is going to be uh, not only successful, but also comprehensive. Um, so just click on cancel, uh, Akira. Um, and then we have all the same settings that you may have um, as you'd expect. So obviously we're now in the advanced mode. We have you know, coverage exclusions. Um, if you wanted to add any specific regexes to not include a blog that has one and a half thousand pages of the same article with just text and an image. Okay, that's just going to, 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 to cause the scan to go on and on and on for no reason uh, whatsoever. And there's gonna be some really cool technology and functionality coming into play with our, uh, with our scanner that will you know, hopefully be in a position to, to automatically remove those pages. Just click on uh, attack surface optimization, please, Akira. Yeah. Um, and what you have here, this is something that I alluded to in my, in my short introduction, by the way. Um, so the, the engine has a number of scan optimizations already inbuilt into the technology. So, you know, is the scan going to um, keep on going when the target doesn't respond for five minutes or 20 seconds or whatever it might be? There's obviously going to be an issue there, and that's going to cause the scan to, to stop. So this is, an, again, another issue that, that, um, that you have with security testing. So you can set it to... to, to um, either stop the scan or just not stop, uh, not test that particular entry point if there's no response. Smart scan is a really nice functionality of our technology. Just click on the uh, the I dot, please, um, Akira. On the what? Sorry, it's Next to smart scan. Smart scan, yep. There we go. Um, just so people can have a, a something to read there, but it's, it's, it's our engine using smart decisions so that we're minimizing the amount of configuration that you have. Like I mentioned before, 
DAS tools are historically, and even now, built for security professionals, for cybersecurity experts, for penetration testers that want to have a thousand different configurations to look at all the edge cases, to really try and manipulate the scanning. But this just doesn't work and is not going to cut it for developers. What you want to have is a tool that's going to be you know, seamlessly integrated and actually one that you can use to try and find those low to medium hanging fruits early and often that actually you can take and use and that the, the scans are going to be effective um, and with with you know proper actionable results but smart scan will include things like you know parameter skipping it will optimize certain detection phases you know as i mentioned all based around reducing scan time but built for developers developers are, you know um you know you've, you're you're releasing code at, at breakneck speeds it's all about cicd it's all about automation it's all about speed and we really want to make our scanner run as fast as possible to remove that that lengthy time wasting um, with, uh, with, with scans that, that just run for far too long, which is why they've historically been carried out by security and in pre, uh, pre-prod or staging, for example. Um, so we can run all the tests, skip certain parameters, static parameters that just aren't going to have an effect on the scan, all about maximizing uh, the speed there. Thank you, Akira. Um, and um, yeah, you can change these specific paths if you just scroll down a little bit, Akira. Um, Come on. Yeah, so uh, you can choose which path you want. You can choose all of them, some of them. If you just wanted to run a quick um, you know, header scans, for example, then you have that option. If you just click on the network tab as well, please. Mm -hmm. Network down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can also change the number of concurrent requests. And obviously, this is going to affect scan time as well. So it defaults to 10. Uh, but if you know if you think you can take it or the application has the sort of bandwidth, then um, you can run up to 50 or indeed you can have it up to a thousand concurrent requests against the application. This is like the number of threads, the number of uh, attack payloads that we're going to be running uh, running against your, your target application. And this will determine the speed at which your um, your scan will, uh, will will complete as well. So just bear it in mind, you know obviously you guys can have a play around with this um so um yeah any questions go to our docs docs dot bright and i'm going to put it into the um into the chat now as well um, just so that you uh that you have those as well it's really aimed to be as self-service as possible um so any questions uh, feel free to look out at that as well um okay and then let's look at the tests um we might as well show people the tests sure. um yeah, uh, no, 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 create oh, scan. <laughs> That's right. Uh, create scan, tests. Just go to tests on the left. That's the one. So you can see here the, the, the sort of common vulnerability test that we cover. Um, you can see there, learn more about our test. That will take you to the guide uh, with a full list of our vulnerability uh, testing categories that we cover. Um, but we really do have a, a, a large uh, coverage here. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, internal benchmarks, um, even when comparing us to some of the aforementioned DAS scanners that someone mentioned, um, uh, we really do have you covered. We're really about enabling you to, to rely much less on uh, manual security testing. Um, and if you scroll down as well, Akira, to the business logic uh, part of it, um, this is what I mentioned before. This is where our engine um, leverages the natural language processing and the very active way that we run scans against the target, interacting with it like a human, uh, using our headless um, browser technology to interact with certain parts of the application, um, understanding the responses we're getting back and being able to use those responses to then carry out uh, a chained attacks against the target gives us the ability of carrying out business logic vulnerability tests. So um, trying to break that logic, the validation mechanisms of the target, as I mentioned, yes, they are fairly limited at the moment. Uh, we will soon be releasing a, a number of different uh, other business logic tests, uh, testing scenarios and categories, but it's really about trying to find as much as we can, as early as often uh, as we can as well. And business logic vulnerability tests has only been carried out by manual security testing. And really what we're trying to do here is to try and minimize your reliance on manual penetration tests, manual tests by the security team, whether they're done daily 
monthly, or in most cases, yearly. This all goes back to automation, being secure by design, and ensuring that security testing can keep up with your rapid release cycles. Um, and the more that we can find as early as possible, the better. So we're really, really spearheading um, the efforts in being able to carry out uh, business logic vulnerability tests in an automated way that's going to enable uh, developers uh, to own that uh, to own that process. And we also have, if you just scroll down a bit more, Akira, uh, the third-party tests, which include your JavaScript uh, vulnerabilities that you know just ensures that you're uh, you're up to date um, and patched accordingly. Um, so let's just have, take a bit of time to, um, to have a look at the um, the questions here. Um, Right. Um, we have access to a recorded webinar later. Yes, I didn't know people manipulate the scanning. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, other DAS tools, of course, they can be manipulated. Of course, we have multiple different settings with regexes and amongst other things, uh, different authentication mechanisms as well. Um, but really, it's um, it's um, uh, it can be a very complicated process, particularly, by the way, a lot of the configuration is carried out to ensure that the results and the output you're getting are going to be actionable, i.e., how can we try and remove false positives? This is automatically carried out by our engine. So every result that we have is validated automatically by our engine. So we do not have false positives. If, we, if you do have a false positive, um, that for us is a bug. We are also a technology. We all have bugs. But that for us is, um, is, a, is, is a bug. So, you know, we really, really pride ourselves uh, on this. And we have you know, case study after case study of the amount of time that we're saving developers in, uh, in, in, in the manual validation, the amount of time that, uh, uh, that people are investing um, in manually validating is, is astronomical. But worse than that, they're not manually validating it because they've got too many. You could run a scan against an application um, and have 50, 60, 70% false positives and the rest. It's just not scalable. And in the world of CICD and DevOps, you need application security testing that's going to be scalable. And one of the, the, the biggest pain points and um, blockers is that manual validation. So uh, rest assured that uh, you won't have that issue with Bright. Um, yes, I had to go. Yes, it will be recorded. That was 10 minutes ago. So um, if you are seeing this on the recording, yes, sir. hello again. Um, and let's see here. Um, Russia likes the advanced use cases. This is awesome. Thank you very much. Um, currently job between multiple tools to validate API scan coverage. Great, uh, Kenya. You know, this is really, um, this is why we've inbuilt, inbuilt um, the uh, API schema editor as part of our technology. We know that the API schema needs to be validated. Okay, they don't start jumping between one and the other. We've inbuilt it. It's like an API linter. Um, to enable you to do that. So please do take advantage of that. And we actually have other clients that just upload the schema or the, the Swagger documentation and just, just use it for the linter to see where they're, where they're going. So you've got multiple use cases there uh, to use it. Uh, James, yes, we support Postman. That is awesome. I completely agree with you. So please do, uh, do take advantage of that. Um, everyone asking if this will be recorded, which is great. Um, and of course, you can share this with your colleagues, share this with your teams. Um, let them use it. Use the docs.brightsec.com um, as a self-service module as well um, to go a bit deeper. And I would stress all of you, we've, we've, we're just scratching the surface now on the capabilities. As Akira mentioned in her opening uh, comments, this is really supposed to be used as part of your CICD. Look out for another workshop that we have um, in about a month's time where we're going to show you how to integrate this into your CICD using GitHub Actions. Okay, this is like a, an, an introductory one that you can use now uh, using the UI. If you want to get ahead of that, and you want to start implementing it now, and I wouldn't blame you for wanting to do that, go onto our docs, look at the CI integrations. We have step-by-step -step guidance on how to integrate it uh, with example configuration files so that you can really be up and scanning uh, within uh, minutes. Um, James, again, looks like the API schema would be perfect. I agree. Uh, but you'd expect me to agree with that. Um, the, okay, and I think we've caught up with the questions. Uh, oh, no, there is one new message. Um, let me see here. Third-party tests, is that NPM packages? So that's JavaScript, uh, JavaScript uh, 
um, libraries uh, and vulnerabilities to ensure that you're uh, fully patched there. Uh, we do have something in a Q&A. Uh, Abhijit, can I sign up for a free account with another email? I have problems with sign up. Yes, you can. Um, no problem, uh, no problem at all. Um, uh, you still need both. Oh, I see there have been. Oh, Akira's on some questions. My apologies. I wasn't looking at QA. So thank you, Akira. Um, I believe you still need both SAST and DAST. Well, look, SAST is a very, very good, useful tool. And you know, I don't think anyone should say that you shouldn't use it. Um, ultimately, you will always need to run a DAST scan because you will always need to do some form of penetration test. As I mentioned before, static analysis is, is very good, but it's you know it's fraught with false positives, mainly when you're particularly when looking looking at um, modern technology, single page applications, microservices based architecture. You need to really try and understand how the application would perform in the wild, and you don't have that capability with with a static analysis. I would never say don't use SAST, um, but um, based on feedback, you know SCA, SAST, and DAST will have you covered. SCA and DAST will also have you covered, but categorically you should be using static analysis too because it's all you know, it's part of the security testing stack that you should be uh, deploying. Um, repeaters running a machine, this is what I can use to run against intranet sites. Yes, absolutely, Akira's answered that. Sorry if I'm going over this again, but perhaps for those of you that aren't monitoring the, uh, the Q&A, it's, it's, it's useful to use. The Akira, um, the Akira, the repeater, could be used to test uh, internal applications, right? So perhaps a dev environment that might not be open to the public, you can use the repeater as a, as a proxy. Um, and we have some um, architectural or solution architect drawings to show you how you can lock down uh, the repeater, you know, for it to be safe, and then to start scanning internal applications or other environments within, uh, within that. Um, Okay, and um, yeah, I think that's all the uh, the questions so far. So, uh, Akira, I, th I think without further ado, one thing we need to do is refresh our screen so that we can look at what vulnerabilities yeah. um, have been uh, have been found. So, um, for those of you that, uh, that probably were stuck on that pending stage, you can see that it's still running, and we can now start looking at the results. So, um, if we can click on that, um, we can see here. Um, the number of requests, you know, related requests, etc. We have details of the. Uh, in fact, Kira, you can go through this. I'm, I've sort of. Yeah, yeah, out. absolutely. Okay. So first off, really briefly, I do want to talk prevention, um, since we have a couple of minutes, um, and then we'll go through the results together. Does that sound like a plan? Cool. Good. I'll, I'll, I'll say yes. <laughs> okay. So. Here's what I want to talk a little bit about is, of course, a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So let's just really briefly go over a few things um, that can help you write more secure code um, for from, from jump, from the get-go, so that uh, maybe when you're running these DAS scans, you don't have as many issues. So number one, we're going to talk about input validation. We're going to talk about output encoding, and then we'll briefly touch on authentication and authorization. These are just some top three things that you can do. Um, there is a coding course that is fantastic that we now offer for free through WeHack Purple, which is called Secure Coding Course. Uh, it has uh, 17 commandments of secure coding. We're only gonna go through three of those 17 today just for time's sake. Um, but I definitely recommend you check out this course. You can find it at wehackpurple.com. I will put that in the chat a little bit later. Maybe Ali, you can set, put it in the chat really briefly. The course is free as of today. It used to be paid, but it is now free. It's fantastic, really great way to learn more about secure coding and how to do it from the get-go. Okay, first off, input validation. So brief story about this. A colleague of mine once had an input validation issue. She had a blind SQL injection in her application and she didn't know about it. The way she found out is Vice Magazine sent her an email and asked her if she would give a quote about how the data of her organization was on sale for the dark web for 50 bucks. And that's how she found out that she had a blind SQL injection in her app, um, which, is an, which is a problem because of input validation. So she actually got in more trouble because she made a joke about oh, is our data really only worth 50 bucks to her boss? Then she actually got in trouble for the problem itself. 
Input validation is the most important thing. Uh, the reason is, is where else do uh, attacks come in? They come in via input, right? If people validated their inputs properly, 80 to 90% of attacks would disappear. So on that note, validate all types of input to your application, human or machine. This can include database queries. It can include URL parameters. It can include body parameters. Anything that goes into your app you need to validate it. You can reduce, reduce or eliminate risk from so many injection attacks just with input validation. A couple other things on this note, server-side validation is mandatory. Um, use an allow list, not a block list. So that essentially means have resources that are allowed and only those resources are allowed. Don't just block out a few things that are problematic. Only use an allow list. It's sometimes also called a whitelist versus a blacklist. Lots and lots of frameworks uh, have this built in now. So use what's provided by your framework and always check, is this input okay? Um, input validation alone can never prevent all attacks, but it can reduce the attack surface and minimize the impact of any attacks that do succeed. Beyond its security implications, data validation is also crucial for software performance, stability, and usability. So this will actually make your code far more, um, far better. All right, we're going to do a quick quiz. I know y'all were looking forward to a quiz. So here we go. Which one of these, the left side or the right side, has input validation? Which one should which one should we use? The one on the left or the one on the right? I'll wait a couple seconds in the chat. All right, yeah, it's the one on the right, right? Because as you can see here on the left, there's absolutely no input validation at all. And on the right, there is input validation. And you can also see here that the code itself is not that much more complicated. It's not too hard to use input validation and to implement that. So always, always, always validate your inputs. Okay, similar kind of layer two of defense after you've validated all your inputs is uh, encoding all of your outputs. So what does that mean? So essentially what, from the OWASP definition, which is an organization internationally for cybersecurity, they define output encoding as uh, involving translating special characters into some different but equivalent form that is no longer dangerous to the target interpreter. For example, um, you would uh, potentially translate the sideways uh, caret character like this, like the less than character, into an ampersand LT when writing to an HTML page. Essentially what happens here is that it makes these special characters occur to a server as data, not as code to be executed. Anything that reflects back onto your screen must have output encoding. Um, does anybody have an example of like output encoding that you have seen on uh, your work that you can put in the chat? Uh, if so, please go ahead and do that. Um, one other thing I do want to say that if without output encoding, someone can write essentially JavaScript, it, put it in your input. And if your input if your input validation fails, they can run all kinds of wonky code on your server. They can destroy your server. They can steal data. They can corrupt files, you name it. So always use output encoding. Again, there are frameworks that deal with this. Um, or sorry, there are tools inside of frameworks that deal with this. Um, it's, it's a good layer of defense. If you use input encoding, excuse me, input validation and output encoding, you are in a really, really good place as far as writing more secure code. Lastly, I want to talk about authentication and authorization. So authentication and authorization um, is an interesting topic. Uh, essentially what it is, is it is asking who are you? Are you the real you? And are you even supposed to be here? And what are you allowed to do? Um, one thing that I want to mention on this, and I used to work in an auth shop, and this was really important for us to get across, is that you should never write your own authentication. The reason being is that it is so hard to write. It is incredibly expensive. It takes a lot of manpower to maintain. Um, and a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll just salt and hash their passwords, put them in the database and call it done. That is definitely not enough. Um, here's a story about why it's not enough. So for example, uh, once upon a time in cybersecurity land, there was a breach of a company and they stole a bunch of emails and they stole a bunch of passwords. 
Now that would be bad enough if they wanted to just log into that company's resources and take information from that company. However, the truth of it is, is that most people use the same email and password combination all over the internet. So what they did is they cross referenced these email password combinations with things like banks and they stole $20 million overnight. So that is just with the with the sets of credentials that they cross referenced. It wasn't from an it wasn't initially from a bank. They didn't breach a bank, but they use those credentials to log into banks and steal money. So authentication authorization is a really really big deal. Don't write your own auth. Use a third party provider. Okay, now we're going to get into discussing the scan results. So what I'm going to do is I have actually finished a scan earlier. Um, that we're going to go over today while all of y'all's scans, of course, are still running. Let me go ahead and log into my account here. I will pull it over to the screen in just a second. And we're going to go over some of the most common issues that people have um, in their scans when a lot of these are on the OWASP top 10. So let's go ahead and pull this over. All right. Let's see here. Scans. Okay. I'm not going to uh, show you the scans that I initially had on my personal website because it was super embarrassing and I went and fixed all of them. <laughs> but you can also, I do want to mention that if you have written permission from a person who is allowed to give you that permission, you can scan a website. So if you have your own personal website, a really fun activity is to go scan your own site and realize, oh my God, I have so many security vulnerabilities I didn't even know about. Um, Rasha, I used to work for Fusion Auth, full disclosure. I think they're fantastic. I would recommend them, but Auth0 is great. Um, there's a bunch of other fantastic things on the market right now. Okay, so let's go over these scan results. The first thing I wanna go over is reflective cross-site scripting. This is a big one. Um, if you have heard of cross-site scripting, can you just put like, raise your hand or put like yes in the chat? I'm sure you have. What I do wanna say about this from get-go is yes, yes, it's very, very, very popular. Um, it happens a lot. Input validation would have blocked this. Output encoding would have been a second layer of defense. Um, it is super important to validate your inputs. If you take nothing else away from today, of course it says secure coding is worth your time, but secondly, validate your inputs. Okay, um, something else that you can use to deal with this is the content security policy header. We will deal with this in just a moment. So I will show you here. We're going to go to issues. And right here, you can see, bam, high severity reflective cross-site scripting. We're going to scroll down. This, for example, is one of the um, URLs that we found it on. We're going to expand that. And here you can see, you can see details of where it was. You can see remedy suggestions of how to fix it, um, possible exp exposure. Uh, you can learn more about it here. Also, one thing that I think is cool is that it actually shows you the URL of where they found this issue, which is really good for when you're troubleshooting it and where you're fixing it. Um, let's go down here. Here's the body of the web page it was found. And then one other thing that we give you, which is really helpful, is actually a screenshot of what that cross-site scripting attack did or whatever the attack was that you choose. You can, you can see some evidence that it happened. So in this case, it just made a little pop-up come up, right? Not a big deal, yeah? Well, actually, reflective cross-site scripting is a really big deal. Um, what happens in cross-site scripting is that an attacker's JavaScript runs in your browser against you and your computer. So let's talk a little bit about what they can do. They can download a keylogger and watch everything that you do. They can turn on your webcam and sell stuff that they capture on the webcam to people on the internet. They can turn on people's mics and listen to you. They can install malware on your machine. That malware can spread to other machines and all, they can also do ransomware. Cross-site scripting has all the power of JavaScript, which is very, very pop-up, very, 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 uh, it's a big deal. We'll just say it that way. Um, what I want to say is that we're not in pop-up uh, box territory anymore. They can do also things like command and control. They can control your computer from afar. It's really, really, really messy. So how do we fix it? 
Okay, input validation, big one. Input validation would have blocked cross-site scripting and output encoding would have been a second layer of defense. You can also add what's called a content security policy header, which essentially lists all the resources that are allowed to for your website to go to. Um, do not set it to star. And what I mean by star, I'll put in the chat. Essentially, do not say that you can allow any and all kinds of input come in and any and all kinds of input come out. Um, if you have any experience with cross-site scripting or honestly any of these things we talk about, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, would love to hear maybe some, some horror stories. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's pause really quick before we go to the next issue and answer some questions. Is there any way to quickly check if you fixed an issue or do you have to rescan the entire website? So you can do smaller scans. Um, and I think Ollie, you can just like you showed earlier, right? You can just select the one type of thing that you want to scan. So for, yeah, like, so yeah. actually if you go back to the UI. Yeah, let's see here. Okay, so now you've got that, click on that reflective cross-site scripting one at the top. Uh, no, no, no. Go, go down to issues. There you go, click on that one, any, any one of those. Yeah, like that. Yeah, and what you'll see um, is the little pencil mark at the top. Mm -hmm. Modify script. Now what you have the ability here of doing is, if you wanted to, you could amend the request with a, with a request editor if you wanted to try and manipulate that. Um, and then it also enables you to, uh, to scroll down uh, to the bottom, I think. Execute. So you can actually execute the specific payload and sort of see what, uh, what comes up. So that's a good way of being able to understand um, where your, your vulnerabilities are. And actually, one thing we haven't covered, if you just click on uh, projects on the left, the left nav bar. Mm -hmm. What you have here is to uh, so click on everyone. Um, so that's the group. So what you also have here is a project view. So just zoom out a little bit because it's a bit zoomed in. Yeah, that's right. um, yeah. But what this will give you um, uh, is maybe a bit more to zoom out once more. Sure. What this will also give you, by the way, is um, an understanding of you know, once you've run multiple scans. Okay, now. This is showing as uh, you know recurring, recurring. I'm not sure if we've run two tests, um, but um, we can you can see which of your issues are new, which are recurring. You can mark them as resolved. You can ignore them, or whatever it might be. But a really, really good way of you being able to understand: okay, where are my new issues? Have I seen this specific issue before? Um, is another really good way of doing it, but. You know, once remediation has been attempted, as you know, if you're using the, the crawler, for example, uh, and it's the same URL, then yeah, it can just uh, it can sort of just replay that attack against that specific uh, against that specific entry point, and it's a good way of just being under understanding. Okay, well, is this is this the same issue that we found before? And you know, we talk about developers leading the charge with security testing. Actually, for um, for security training awareness, okay, it's great to understand. Okay, let's say we have this team, this squad, whatever it might be, assigned to a specific application, a specific API, a part of an application. Um, actually, what we want to be able to, to do is almost have it like a benchmarking. So is this team got a problem with cross-site scripting, with SQL injection or whatever? So you get the, if you're an engineering manager, you can get global visibility of that. And then actually you'll know where to apply specific training, whether that's via a third party, whether that's via We Hack Purple, where you can go online and look at courses maybe specific to um, certain vulnerabilities. And if you have any ideas or thoughts about that, then please do reach out to us. And as the sponsor of the We Hack Purple uh, community and uh, courses, uh, which we want to offer for life for free, um, let us know. How can we improve that? What's going to be of interest to you? And we can start building some courses around that for you with pleasure because we want to enable to, we want to be able to give you everything you need to be as successful as possible. And that's not just using our, 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 our DAS scanner, by the way. It goes further and, above that, uh, further and beyond that with education, with courses, to really, really try and help you um, to, uh, to, to get security testing uh, done properly and automated. So, you know, do use this as well, um, just to have a look and see, you know, where, where your issues are. Um, and so I hope that answered the, uh, the question. Uh, Rasha says, awesome. Yes, uh, I agree. 
Um, okay. Okay, that's it okay. Uh, for the questions so far. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, okay, let's go on to another issue. We'll go back here to scans. And let's see here, we'll go here to issues and we're going to find unauthorized cross-site request forgery. This is down here. Here we go. Bam. Again, you can see here all the places it happens. We can expand it to get some details about what CSERF, it's called CSERF, cross-site request forgery, so CSERF for short, uh, where it happens, some remedy suggestions, maybe what might have happened to have it be a problem in the first place, uh, the URL where it happens. Um, and then for, in this case, there isn't a picture to prove it, but um, since we have no false positives, you can be assured that this actually is an issue. So let's talk a little bit about CSERF. So what it is and why it's scary and how to fix it. So would input validation help this? Why, yes, yes, it would. Um, however, the defenses are not necessarily input validation. The defenses are passing a CSERF token. Um, but uh, so what I guess I'll say to that is that input validation would help, but the main defense is passing a CSERF token. So why is CSERF scary? Well, let me say it this way. CSERF attacks are client-side attacks that can be used to redirect users to a malicious website, steal the sensitive information from them, or execute actions while using a user session token or a user session cookie. It's a big deal. Um, it used to be on the OWASP top 10. Now it's number 13. Uh, the reason it's number 13 is because frameworks came in and started fixing CSERF. Um, but at the end of the day, what happens is that a user is tricked into sending a forged request to a server along with the credentials of an already authenticated app. So if you have a banking app that's already authenticated and you're tricked into sending those authentication credentials to a to a bogus server, that's a big deal. Now they have all your auth all of your um all of your auth information. So how do we fix it? There's a in order of operations, there are three things that you can really do. You can do number one, pass an anti CSERF token. This is the best way to deal with CSERF. Number two, you can use a CAPTCHA anytime you are doing a transaction. That's a little bit more cumbersome. Users don't really like CAPTCHAs. And then number three, which works, but it's the most cumbersome for users, is you could ask them to re-enter their password. At that point, you're going to risk users just abandoning your site because they don't want to re-enter their password. Okay, let's stop for a moment for questions. Looks like Ollie is doing a great time. Uh, One thing I'd job. also... One thing I'd also say, by the way, just in response to Abhijit's um, um, answer, um, yeah. of course, feel free to reach out to Akira, but actually, if you're looking for uh, support questions as well, you can email support at brightsec.com. Go to our Discord server, by the way. Um, our uh, support engineers, you know, monitor that for questions. We really want to, you know, ensure that that community is being used. If you have um, any issues, feel free to reach out to us there. You'll also realize, by the way, that at the bottom left-hand corner of the UI, we also have an online chat facility. This gives you direct access to our support engineers. Uh, they may come back to you immediately, as they do um, um, in many cases, um, or it might take time. But either way, we're here to support you. We're here to guide you. We want you to succeed. So please do, um, you know, please do take advantage of that, and we can uh, and we can come back to you. Um, yeah, I don't think there are awesome. any other uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. okay, let's go over one more issue. And this issue is called open bucket. So if you have an idea of what that might mean, please feel, put, feel free to put that in the chat. But what would an open bucket mean? Well, let's expand it here. Here it is right here in high severity. Okay, so an open bucket essentially is when someone's S3, so Amazon S3 buckets, are open and people can see anything that is inside of them. Long story short, I don't want all my photos or API keys or resources on my on my or my users S3 buckets to be available to everybody. And I'm quite sure that you probably don't know or don't either. So how do we fix it? First off, you can make templates for your organization. You can use secure defaults when you configure your S3 buckets. And last but not least, scan your app. Scan your app often, scan your app early with Bright or a similar desk, and it will find it. 
one cool thing I want to show you here that I, I get a kick out of is, um, let's see, is this the right, nope, this is not the right tab. This is not the right tab. I got too many tabs open. Okay, here we go. What we will do is um, we can actually show you what we found in your bucket. So in this case, we have an awesome photo of an airplane in the woods. We found that picture in your open bucket. We found this picture in your open bucket, which is how I would feel if I had my buckets open. I'd feel very silly, like a cow stuck in a tree. And then last but not least, we have a picture of an elephant. So that's all pretty PG, but sometimes people's pictures are not necessarily this benign. Also, people can store API keys and whatnot in these buckets, and that's a problem because then you can have these web crawlers that go through, look for these, look for these um, open buckets, and now they have all your API keys. So it's a big deal. And there have been okay. some there have been some very high prominent uh, breaches with that specific issue. It's a really mm -hmm. easy one to forget uh, or to miss. Um, one that obviously we uh, we cover, um, but one that can be so damaging um to your organization um that uh that yeah certainly one that's uh that you don't want to miss out so um we put a bit of a funny spin to it but uh, i think as akira's mentioned the ramifications of that can be really quite severe and that's something else to just underline again is that this is not a security vulnerability that most people think of right they think of cross-site scripting they think of csirp but not many people think about open buckets, right? Which is why I include it on this list, which is also um, why, um, why we rate it as a high severity issue as well. Okay, that's it for the results that we're gonna go over. As you can see, there are many, many more. They have information on all of them. You can click on the um, like open issue section and expand them into seeing more about the issue. Let me show you how to do that one more time. So you go to issues, maybe you want to learn about, oh, I don't know, directory listing, you're going to push down, you can open here with the box with the, with the uh, arrow in it and open it up in a new tab and it'll teach you more about the issue itself. We're also working on some video tutorials, like very, very short videos about each issue, um, and that will be released hopefully in the near future, so that will also be just some more information for you to learn more about the issue and how to fix it. So that's quickly, all for the Akira. Yep. Uh, Mike's got a question about the open bucket case. Oh yeah, um, sure. And to what extent could Bright take action against those accounts that misuse the platform? So, yes. Mike, that's really um, we're preventing you from getting to that point. The whole point of this is that you want to find it before uh, before the case, so that actually you don't need to take any action against those accounts. And just to confirm, we're a we're a dynamic application security scanner. We're there to detect it. Um, you know, what, uh, what happens once it's been, uh, you know, exploited by a malicious actor, um, you know, your, your uh, uh, executive team will be, will be dealing with, I'm sure. But the whole purpose of this is that you don't want to be in a position where your executive team is dealing with security vulnerabilities and bugs uh, because they've been exploited. Find them early, running this DAS scanner, you know, on your applications, um, you know, that's, by the way, just to make everyone clear, because I don't think we mentioned it before, our scanner is safe to use on production um, on production sites. Okay, so you can run this against your own uh, applications. Uh, you'll have to do it through the repeater so that it's uh, an authorized target um, to find and see what security vulnerabilities do you have now. But the whole purpose and premise of this is, as we've mentioned before, is putting security testing into your development pipelines, ideally. Um, finding this way before, way before they hit production. That really is the key. You don't want to be worrying about what shall we do once it's happened. Nip it in the bud and make sure it doesn't happen. Totally. Yeah, that's a, like I said, this, the, the intention of teaching you this tool is to empower you to shift security left. So scan early, scan often, find these problems before you send it to QA, um, go ahead and fix these problems before you send it to QA. Um, and your code quality will go through the roof. Like secure code is more is more quality code every time. Okay, on that note, you are not a hacker now. Sorry. 
So web app scanners like Bright or like SaaS tools or anything like that are not foolproof. Like all point and click software, it can miss things. So the point of this exercise is to catch all the obvious security flaws and to train you to search for security flaws from the get go. Um, other security activities within your SDLC will make your app even more secure. So whether that's like an AppSec program at your company, whether you're also using a SaaS tool or a different kind of security tool, maybe you're hiring a pen tester, other security activities will obviously make your app even more secure. Please do not learn what you used for evil. Um, the thing is, is that if we can point a scanner against a web app and find all the security vulnerabilities, so can malicious actors. They can use similar tools to find security vulnerabilities in your code. So please, please, please do not take our tool or any other tool for that matter and start messing with people's stuff. Um, and actually please do fix the bugs that you find. Um, that would be fantastic. And then you'll become a more secure coder. Okay, I wanna leave you with some resources. So first resource to leave you with is me. Um, you can email me. You can find me on Twitter at the, the Akirati, which is like the Illuminati, but it's the Akirati. All right, anyway, I'm too corny for my own good. Um, you can also use courses from We Hack Purple. It is a cybersecurity community as well as education platform. There are a ton of community members. They talk things all, they talk all things cybersecurity. They are infosec people, they are software engineers, they are students, they are CISOs. There are all kinds of people and the whole point of them is to talk software security. They have webinars, they have um, YouTube videos. They, like I said, they have a whole academy that is now free as of today. It is all free, which is fantastic. Really, really great resource. Um, our blog is fantastic. If you go to brightsec.com slash blog, we have a ton of amazing resources. Um, and a lot of really good articles on things like CSERF, on things like secure coding, on things like, oh, I just found this weird vulnerability and I don't know what it means. How do I fix it? Fantastic blog, lots of good resources there. Um, the secure coding course that I mentioned earlier from we, from we, excuse me, from we Hack Purple, which is wehackpurple.com. Um, you can use that. You can take that course. There are the 17 uh, commandments for secure coding that are talked about in depth in that course. They're fantastic. Um, and also, there is a fantastic book that my coworker Tanya Janka wrote called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. It's all about secure coding. It goes super in depth. It will teach you how to write secure code. And on that note, we're actually giving away a free copy of it. It's a free ebook. Um, what you have to do to try to win this book um, is go to twitter.com slash bright appsec and answer this question. So the question is this. In regards to secure coding, what small action can you take right now in your own work without needing any further resources or authority? So go to twitter.brightappsec. It's going to be the pinned tweet and reply to that tweet with your answer. We'll pick the best answer in the next couple of days. We'll DM you on Twitter and say, hey, you won. And then we'll get your email address and you can win a free copy of that book. So um, I'm going to go ahead and Ollie, can you actually put the Twitter link in the chat for people. Will, yeah, and just before I do that, uh, yeah. RG, RG uh, had to put something in the chat. Um, for those of you that, that want to read it, but he, he raised, I think so he raises a very good point. So interesting to learn how you can scan, set the scan result as a quality gate in the CICD where the, where the devs can't merge unless there are no medium or high vulnerabilities, whilst also having a mechanism that can allow the merge to proceed when exception approval has been secured, e.g. medium level will be fixed in a later date. Absolutely, this can absolutely be carried out. Um, if you do look on the uh, the docs, by the way, um, so there'll be an example with uh, with GitHub Actions. Um, I've done previous, um, previous talks uh, and workshops on this very, very topic where even we showcase that to you. So if you want to have a look at that, please do. We will also have a uh, another workshop in about a month, which will be showcasing mm -hmm. how you can integrate the bright security scanner as part of your pipeline, but this can all be configured via your um, uh, .yaml um, configuration files. So you can set the breakpoint. You can set what happens after the breakpoint. So the build will fail on 
uh, medium, fail on high, but be okay. Or you can set it to still merge on that, but also be notified. And the, the configuration is, is, is all there, configured via code, and we have a full command list on our docs, docs.neurolegion.com. Uh, um, Got to stop saying uh, call us Neurolegion. Um, so it's all there for you, uh, RJ. Absolutely, you can. We have examples of that uh, as well um, to, um, you know, to fail builds accordingly. And just to reiterate, we've automatically validate every finding, okay? I know, I know I sound like a broken record, but it really, really is important. A lot of people tend not to add any breakpoints, et cetera, because how can you possibly add a breakpoint when 80% of your findings are going to be false positives? Actually, now you have the ability to do that with automatically validated results. So you know categorically that if there's a medium or high severity uh, uh, vulnerability that's been detected by our engine, it is there. It needs to be actioned now or you will be pushing into production with a medium or high severity issue. Um, so really, really useful tool. Absolutely, you can uh, in, uh, integrate it into the CI um, and absolutely you should. And uh, please feel free to look at our uh, docs, docs.brightsec.com. Also go to the resources page on our website and you'll see that there will be other uh, video recordings that you can also follow even now on, on how to do that where I take you through the step-to-step -step, uh, process of that. Uh, John, this was truly great. Thank you so much. And Kira really did do a fantastic job, even in the light of some of the technical issues uh, that we had. Hoping I'll be able to integrate this very soon. John, not even hoping. You have to do it. Um, <laughs> it's really, really easy. It's really, really simple. We've given you, uh, you know, we, we haven't given you a fish. We've given you a net so that you can continue to catch multiple fishes, uh, i.e. vulnerabilities moving forward. And yes, it should be uh, integrated into your pipeline, as, uh, as RG mentioned before. Um, Jan or Jan says, great stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. Akira, I'm going to leave it to you as the... Yeah. Um, um, I just wanted to finish up by saying thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I hope you got some really valuable information that you can start applying immediately in your own coding journey. Um, yeah, so just wanted to say thank you and thanks to Ollie for co-presenting and we will see you next time. That concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. And happy hacking your own app. Totally. Your own app. <laughs> yeah, your app. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, everyone.